Welcome back. I've had a couple of suggestions by viewers that I talk about Weatherby cartridges, and uh, so I'm going to do that today. Um, and actually, it's going to entail also the Weatherby rifle with which it's uh, closely paired. Now, <clears throat> before you think that this is uh, just for artistic effect, April happens to be in this section of New Hampshire uh, the season of ticks and bears. Benny goes out and he takes care of the ticks. He goes out and around the yard and collects them, so we have to pluck those off him as much as we can find. And uh, he's doing good, but he's a tick magnet. And uh, the other thing that we have is uh, that bears have come out of hibernation very recently, and uh, they're, they're starved for uh, whatever they can uh, find. So they, they come roaming through the yard here, like, you know, like they own the place, and they, I suppose they do. They, They've been hibernating, as a matter of fact, uh, within within 100 yards of here uh, in the past. So, you know, it's one of those things that we have to put up with. So, I don't I don't have any uh, I don't have any uh, affections to go shooting a bear off season. But uh, you know, being what they are, and they can be pretty they can be pretty uh, big and miserable. Um, and Benny here is a uh, you know he he definitely. He's probably going to try to uh, do something that he shouldn't do. So that's why I have this um, hand iron with me. Well, anyway, it's a beautiful day. I can't believe this now. About three days ago, I woke up. It was 31 degrees Fahrenheit, that is. Uh, and, you know, we had snow only. We had snow falling uh, just less than a week ago. And now I'm sitting out here, and it's in the uh, low 60s. Yesterday, it was 77 degrees. Uh, go figure. I mean, that's that's New Hampshire, that's New England for you. So we have, um, I still have a little patch of snow out here. It's, uh, I can cover it up with, I could cover it up with, uh, you know, a couple of newspapers. That's about the size of it right now. It's about, about this deep beside the barn. And the uh, tractor path coming in from the back, uh, that's, that's, I still got, I still got uh, quite a bit of snow back there. But it's going away. It'll, it'll all be gone probably by today uh, with this beautiful sun out and uh, the grass is greening. So let's get back on to the uh, topic of the Weatherby cartridge. Well, first of all, uh, Roy Weatherby uh, was the founder of the Weatherby Company back in uh, 1945. Now, uh, things, things kind of got a, a rather slow start right off the bat. Um, you know, he, he, brought out, he brought out a series of cartridges that were being cataloged by the time, uh, by about 1950. Um, but the rifle was another story. Uh, so first of all, let's talk about the, let's talk about the rifle itself. He had a vision that uh, he wanted to have a uh, cartridge and rifle that was unique in the world of uh, sporting firearms. You know, Remington and uh, Winchester were going through, they were going through a trying period um, leading up to uh, World War II. Ma manufacturing costs were getting uh, rather high. Um, World War II kind of helped them out a little bit, gave them a boost because naturally they had, they had uh, you know, government contracts throughout that entire uh, duration of the war. Uh, but then at the, at the war's end, uh, things became apparent to those companies that they just could not uh, sustain this, the sort of manufacturing techniques that uh, they did uh, before the war. And uh, so uh, Winchester was going through a difficult time, especially with the production costs of the Model 70 bolt-action rifle, and even the Model 94 was getting to be costly to manufacture. So by the time 1964 came around, they finally you know, that's when they finally had to uh, reckon with the problem and, um, and, and uh, basically lower the, lower the manufacturing cost by changing uh, the designs of uh, certain, certain things. Well, Remington had already, had already gone off on that uh, venture, and uh, that's, that, was, that was Winchester's arch competitor. In order to remain competitive with Remington, uh, Winchester had to follow suit. Savage was having a difficult time. Uh, Savage was uh, starting to go through its first uh, serious, um, you know, financial crises, and um, a lot of other companies were a lot of other companies were basically uh, just kind of hanging on. You know, Harrington and Richardson. A lot of these, a lot of these companies were just uh, not 
uh, you know, going to sustain themselves for too much longer. Another couple of decades, a lot of them would be uh, really in different straits. But Weatherby, uh, he recognized that there was an entirely different uh, market out there. There was a potential market out there that was different than the blue-collar worker that was, you know, straining at the bit in the uh, early, in the in the mid fifties, uh, early fifties, when you know a bolt action rifle was costing somewhere around a hundred, uh, a little over a hundred dollars for a good bolt action rifle. Weatherby saw something else. He saw he saw that the uh, returning the returning veterans were, uh, you know, they were going to they were going to college on the GI Bill, and they were coming out of MIT and uh, Harvard, and there was a there was another culture. It was like a it was like a, a, a America's own. Uh, royalty class. Uh, they, these were people who were, you know, the the, the doctors and the lawyers, uh, and um, you know, people who people who uh, could drive around in, in uh, Mercedes and, and things like that. They had they had more money, uh, and also too, you know, you had um, you, you had uh, people in the in the uh, banking community that that had a lot of money. Uh, and technology, you know, space technology was really starting to take off. This was at the beginning of the space race in the early early 50s. So, um, all these things combined to open up a market that Winchester and Remington had never tapped into before, which was, uh, you know, a, a rather wealthy American class that, that could afford uh, a rifle that was essentially twice the twice the cost of a costly uh, rifle. You know. It sounds cheap now, but you know when a hundred and twenty-four dollar rifle was being made, that represented a couple of weeks' salary, uh, take-home pay. Uh, that was no small amount of money. Um, and when uh, you know when Weatherby offered began offering his rifles in the uh, by the time the by the time the uh, early '60s came along, when he finally things finally settled down, I should say probably about 1956 is when. The first, uh, the first rifle started moving out of the door on a regular basis, uh, but by then, uh, you know, his rifles were way up there. I mean, they'd over double the cost of a of a uh, otherwise very good American uh, bolt action rifle, and that's pretty much the same as it is today. Uh, Weatherby rifles, are roughly speaking, you know, 40 to 50 percent greater cost than uh, a comparable, I should say, a a, a rifle of similar um, uh, of, of similar stature. So, what is the Weatherby rifle? Well, the Weatherby rifle is uh, we we call it the Mark V action. It's called the Mark V action because it took it took five tries before it before it finally uh, came to fruition. And uh, it's a it's a fancy sounding name, you know. You can drive around the Mark V car and all that stuff. So, Mark V would just sound pretty sexy. But the Mark V rifle uh, was distinguished by the fact that it used a very heavy um, interrupted thread uh, breech. Now, uh, an interrupted thread is a is a not is not a new idea. Uh, artillery pieces have been using interrupted thread breeches for uh, many for decades, and basically, I'll, I'll put a I'll put a picture of it up here. Uh, but basically, can, you know, imagine a a, a, a continuing thread on a bolt, but then eliminate 50% uh, of its cuts every other, you know, in in alternating sequence, so that there's enough room for the threaded sections to fit between on the smooth sections when you rotate it, and it pulls back. It's a very strong, very strong breech because basically you're you're, you're threading, you're, you're screwing that um, breech together the same as if you, but instead of winding it through. You know, you're doing it with just basically a, a third of a turn of the bolt. So it, it affected it, it affected uh, not only a very strong breach, but it also uh, gave a short bolt throw. So you know, with the development now, scopes were scopes were starting to come into the main. Oh, by uh, by the 60s, you know, people were starting to look at telescopes that hadn't been interested in them before. You know, scope scopes before the Scopes before the 60s were a very expensive proposition, and uh, they weren't, you know, the ones that anybody could afford, they, they had their problems. You know, you had, uh, you didn't have constantly centered reticles. Uh, as, you, as you sighted in your reticle, uh, as you sighted in your scope, 
the reticle actually moved on you. It, it could you you could end up with the reticle, you know, scented not scented, but you know, stuck up in the you know, two o'clock position on your scope. You know, you, you it was it was a strange situation, but you know that's that's the way things could very easily occur because the the crosshairs themselves actually moved rather than rather than moving the uh, the lens architecture underneath the turret. So. And you know, optics optics were uh, iffy. Uh, they they had they had other problems. They had problems with sealing the scopes uh, and all that stuff. So I'm getting off topic, but scopes started to become more popular by the time the the mid to late '60s came around. And that and that short bolt throw became a very appealing thing for those people who wanted to have a scope that you know would otherwise get in the way. Pardon me for a moment. I'm just gonna. I'm going to light up one of my Don Raphael's, um, and uh, we got Benny. Uh, the sun is out well intermittently right now. There's uh, cloud cover, and um, Well, I might as well. I might as well also uh, open up my. I've got my Tuckerman Pale Ale. Now, Tuckerman is a. Uh, that's a, a regional. That's a local pale ale that's uh, made just north of me, a few miles north of me. It's a, I love it. It's uh, Tuckerman Ravine. Look that up on. Um, look that up on uh, line. Tuckerman Ravine is a place is a place uh, just uh, overlooks us here. Um, about 35 miles north of me, there's uh, Mount Washington, uh, which can rightfully claim the world's worst weather. Uh, and anyway, and on this bottle, you'll see uh, all these all these people. This is a picture of this is a picture of the folks who uh, this time of year now will be the intrepid souls that will carry their skis up uh, Tuckerman Ravine and uh, ski that. They'll ski the head wall and, and uh, stuff. And uh, they can do that right into July because that's how long that 55-foot snowpack will last. It's, a, it, it's quite a thing. Now, I've never done it. I mean, I, I, was, I was quite a skier when I was uh, in my younger days. I long ago gave it up, probably about 25 years ago. But... Um, I just never got up there. I just never. Uh, but it was always one of those legendary places for somebody to um, go up and ski. So anyway, uh, the um, the Weatherby rifle uh, was a. It was a rifle that appealed to you know was basically marketed to appeal to an entirely different class of uh, hunting customer. You know, the typical catalog of the day, you know, for uh, the different companies, Marlin and Winchester, Remington, Savage and everything, you know, it, it usually depicted some sort of very homey scene of, um, you know, father and son or something like that, or, you know, buddies sitting around a campfire or a card table, or, you know, cigars and beer or whatever. But it, it was always it was always a rather homey scene. The guys wearing buffalo plaid uh, wool jackets and stuff. Well... Weatherby's, Weatherby's catalogs were very glossy, uh, and, and they they were almost, they were like a magazine, and they featured they featured Roy Weatherby uh, on hunting uh, safaris in Africa, and uh, you know, big bush hats, and expensive uh, you know ca khaki tropical clothes, you know, and, and all that stuff, and and uh, guides. It was it was a whole different it was a whole different market. I mean, this was not the sort of this was not the sort of fair that uh, the average person would even be able to dream of. But that was the market that Roy Weatherby was going after, and he knew it was out there, and he and he tapped into it. Um, and he also did it with he wanted to do it with a uh, with a very uh, a very um, sexy cartridge too. He wanted to be able to say that his cartridge was uh, the fastest on the planet. And he pretty much achieved that. Um, now, the problem with a good cigar is that they don't like to stay lit. You know, 
the, the, com the, the, the comedian George Burns He was once interviewed and he said that he, he smoked the finest cigars uh, except when he was on stage because on stage he said they didn't stay lit, you know, he, he always smoked the cheap stuff, you know, the El Producto Panatellas or something like that he smoked because they just stay lit while we were talking. So here I am in my monologue and I've got I've to somehow keep my stogie going. And Benny's having a good time. Uh, He's been uh, doing. He's been doing just great. He's getting a little bit gray, you know. He, he but uh, he's doing well. And so far, I haven't. Uh, I picked a couple of ticks off him uh, yesterday, and uh, they really get after him. But he's a true tick magnet. So anyway, his his uh, his rifle was extremely strong. Um, it was built to withstand the uh, the very high pressures that he was uh, he was testing pressures up to you know a hundred thousand pounds per square inch internal chamber pressure um, and his bolt his bolt was definitely tested against other bolts and found to be as strong as he claimed it was there was no question about that um, and you know over time he he relaxed his pressures and they came back down to they came back down to fairly standard pressures but he wanted to have something that would truly uh, hang together. I think it was claimed at one time that he could that, that they could obstruct the bore with a with a with one or two bullets and still fire it, and the gun would hold together. That's how that's how strong the gun was. Uh, it's not something you want to be testing, and I don't know uh, I don't know if I ever I ever had that uh, verified, but uh, it was it was an extremely strong gun and a very fancy gun. Um, Something that something that was probably a, a probably far more appealing back in the day, back in the 50s and 60s. You know, people really they really liked that stuff. They liked that. You know, when when a rifle had that high gloss lacquered finish uh, that you could you know it looked like you'd swim in it. It was so it was so uh, shiny, and uh, that's what he put on his that's what he put on his guns, um, and uh, you know ornate checkering, checkering with uh, geometric diamonds in it and uh, skip line checkering and, and all the stuff that uh, required that much more uh, care by the artisan. And um, his rifles were distingu distinguished by steeply uh, sloped uh, combs. And that was actually a practical consideration because a steeply sloped comb comes away from your face as the recoil uh, comes back instead of slapping you in the face and and it was a, it was a it was something that it was something that benefited his cartridge which I'll speak about in a second um, but you know he had uh, rosewood four end tips I'm not talking about plastic rosewood colored four end tips it was real rosewood um, and uh, you know rosewood pistol grip caps and uh, inleted uh, inleted ivory back when the, in the day when ivory was uh, still lawful to possess uh, in this country. Inleted, uh, you know, diamonds and things like that in the, in the pistol grip. So the guns offered all that uh, fancy stuff. And it was like I say, it sounds a little bit off the it sounds a little bit off the charts right now. But back in those back in those days, that was still very much appealing. White line spaces and things. There was a company at the time called Winslow that made uh, stocks. I think they've been out of business now for quite a long time. But that was that was their that was their bread and butter was making that style stock even more so. I mean, they they went they their stuff was really radically uh, you know angular and sharp curvatures to the pistol grips and, and very much uh, you know downward angle on the comb so much so that you couldn't pass a cleaning rod uh, into your bore without uh, you know interference so anyway that's what Weatherby was going after and the bluing was superb bluing was I mean it, it, it looked like an ocean it was so dark it was so it was so beautiful if you've ever seen a um, if you've ever seen a uh, Colt Python handgun, that was the kind of bluing that was on a very, very high grade bluing. Everything possible was done to make sure that steel was as shiny as it could possibly be, and the bluing was magnificent. 
So it, it also had the ca capability of being extremely durable. Uh, and, the, and the receiver was uh, beautifully constructed. It, it had uh, nice lines, you know, curvature to the, to the back of the, um, the back of the bolt cap and all that stuff. It was, it was nothing, there was nothing held back to make that gun uh, appealing to the uh, people who could afford it, you know, the people who could travel to Europe to, you know, could, to go on safaris to Africa and, and uh, shoot, shoot the big stuff. Now, what about the cartridge? The cartridge that he, that he designed, he designed a family of cartridges uh, that grew through the years, uh, and some of them, some of them modified. Uh, you know, he, 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 I think altogether now there's, there's uh, been a history of 14 different Weatherby cartridges, um, beginning with the 224 Weatherby cartridge, which was a 22 diameter bore, 224 diameter bore, that um, basically it was, it was a, uh, it was almost as, it was almost as speedy as the two, uh, 22 250. Um, he, that was probably that was one, probably one of the few cartridges where he did not actually uh, beat the competition in terms of velocity in the day. Um, but it's you know it's a, it it uh, it was one of the family and went right up through one of the more popular uh, cartridges was the uh, 270 Weatherby Magnum. They were all Magnums. They were all belted Magnums, and except for the 224, they were all based on the uh, they were they were all based on the. Uh, 300 uh, or 375 Holland and Holland uh, case design with that same that same belt and the same head and all that stuff, uh, but they were they were blown out as far as you could go. You might say that they were they were an improved case design, and they were distinguished by having a rounded radius, a rounded shoulder uh, on the outside of the shoulder, and also an inside radius where it came to the neck. And that was, uh, he called it the Venturi design. And, uh, you know, he marketed that as being uh, a means of uh, making gas flow efficient through the case, uh, whether or not that's a physical factor. I have nobody, it, I think it's argu uh, arguable. Um, but it was, it was a design feature which was definitely something which uh, put it into a, a class of its own. And the other distinguishing feature was that, uh, well, of course, they were huge powder capacities. Powder capacities were right up there. Um, you know, the, the, most, the, the most popular uh, Weatherby cartridge through the years has probably remained the, the 300 Weatherby Magnum, which, which tops the, uh, at that time, remember, when it first came out, uh, I don't believe the 300 Winchester Magnum was yet on the scene, and the uh, the 300 Weatherby Magnum topped the 300 Holland and Holland. So it was it was a, a considerable achievement. Um, and he didn't worry about he didn't worry about you know uh, keeping the action in a standard length like Winchester and Remington were doing by shortening by foreshortening the, the length of a cartridge case so that a 300 Winchester Magnum will fit into a 3006 length uh, action. So, but he didn't worry about such things as that. It was all about power and, and uh, you know, damn the torpedoes full speed ahead. That was the, that was the uh, way he approached it. And then he did another thing with his rifles, which in the chambering, which um, is uh, also designed to keep the keep the lid on the pressures and to moderate uh, pressure, um, and that was to incorporate free bore. Free bore is a lengthening of the parallel section of the uh, basically the mouth of the chamber where the where the bullet resides, sitting in the case. Uh, but it's a lengthening of that parallel smooth section of the chamber that uh, permits the bullet to get a running head stop before it finally en encounters the lead of the rifling, the beginning of the rifling, where it's, you know, the bullet actually uh, hits, hits the ramps of the rifling. Rifling is not an abrupt shoulder there. It's a, they're, they're smooth ramps so that they impress rifling into the, uh, they emboss the rifling into the uh, bullet rather than cutting the rifling into the bullet. Sometimes you'll hear that, you know, the rifling is cut into the bullet, but it's it's not. It's it's embossed into it. It's, it's basically ironed into it as it goes down. So, 
uh, that was that was the other thing. So that was a very significant, uh, you know, change in the uh, approach to chambering a um, uh, a, a cartridge uh, for a rifle. Uh, that was to, to alleviate uh, high pressures. And just as a as a note, make sure that if you ever if if you ever encounter a uh, you know if, if you ever encounter a rifle that was uh, aftermarket chambered or ho homemade. Uh, rifle that was chambered for a Weatherby cartridge. Be very sure that you have a, have a chamber cast made with Cerro Safe or something, and uh, or have a, a gunsmith check it out for you and find out whether or not it's a uh, freeboard uh, freeboard rifle. Because if it's not if it's not freeboard, and there's ways you can you can check you can check that with uh, simply by inserting a bullet into an empty case and seeing uh, how how far that rifling is out there. But um, that does significantly change the way uh, pressures develop in a in a case. And that that trait that feature is uh, the distinguishing, as I've spoken of before. That's the distinguishing feature between the uh, 223 Remington and its uh, cousin, the 5.56 millimeter NATO. The cartridges are identical. The, the brass is exactly the same. Uh, the, the one is not thicker than the other. That's a that that that's true of the that's true of the seven uh, seven point six two NATO, but that's not true with uh, necessarily with uh, NATO five point five six brass. But it it has those chambers are chambered with a, with free bore, and that's that's the distinguishing feature that allows you to shoot higher pressure. Uh, Hotter loads. That that's what a that's what a uh, 5.56 is. The NATO round is a hotter load than a 223, and I'll get I'll get all kinds of people writing me back that it's not. Well, it is because that's an industry fact, and it's not, it's not my opinion. That's an industry fact. Any any anybody can tell you that that, that uh, in the industry, uh, any of the laboratories will absolutely tell you that uh, they run the pressures up to 62,000. Foot pounds of pressure that that is not found in in uh, it's about four or five thousand pounds greater pressure than is found in a, a two twenty three. That was the that was the distinguishing feature with um, Weatherby's uh, cartridges, um, and he, he wanted to have the fastest he wanted to have the fastest cartridges on the block record setting velocities. And he. His 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 philosophy was largely that you know bullet speed was that was the that was the biggest killing factor of it, uh, of all because that uh, caused that dynamic uh, upsetting of fluid tissue uh, you know that would you know that, that would cause immediate uh, shock and uh, and and death of the animal and that's true that's that's all very true you know his his rounds when it when they struck. At standard ranges, with the velocities that those cartridges were uh, being propelled at, well, they they struck they struck on they struck on deer just the same way that a 22 250 strikes a woodchuck. Um, you know, when a 300 Winchester Magnum strikes a, a pra you know a, a prairie animal, you know, a, a mule deer or a um, or an antelope at 250 or 300 yards. It's getting socked with a lot of velocity. Well, it certainly does kill them, and uh, you know you don't have an awful lot to you don't have an awful lot to take home from the butcher. We're going to talk about that too. Um, but you know it, it, they did they did exactly what he uh, claimed, and you know he even did some things which he he ran up the pole. I think he took his 257 Weatherby, uh, which has about that's almost 200 feet per second greater velocity with equal weight bullets than the. Uh, speedy 2506. Um, I think he took. I think he took Elan. You know, huge African uh, antelope. You know, the big Elan he was taking with uh, the 257 Weatherby and everything. So, you know, he proved his point that 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 velocity was stunning, and. You know the people who were the people who were buying that stuff and probably still buy it in, in large measure. Uh, that were that were doing engaging that kind of hunting, 
for the most part, you know, these, these people who drive around in Mercedes and Maseratis, they're not really interested in how much meat they spoil. It, it's, all, it's all about getting the, you know, getting the trophy on the wall and things like that. And uh, so those considerations were not, uh, you know, they were a moot point, you might say. So, uh, but, but for, the average, for the average person who's looking for a rifle, uh, you know, I, let me go back a little bit and, you know, give a caveat is that, you know, vo velocity comes with, a, with several high costs. First of all, Weatherby's rifles were, uh, as I said, about twice as expensive as, uh, as any other competitive rifle. And I shouldn't say competitive because he, he didn't have a competition. His only competition was they, they were considered to be the poor man's, you know, Holland and Holland. If you really want something expensive, and you really could afford it, you know. You went to you, you went to uh, London and you got yourself a Holland and Holland for thousands of dollars, you know. Um, but so this was this was basically a poor man's Holland and Holland, but it was a lot more money than the average person could ever afford, and it's still in many cases the same situation. Uh, the ammo, likewise. Um, it's really not a hand-loaded proposition. I, you don't see too much. You don't see too much Weatherby brass floating around. Um, Weatherby ammunition is expensive. Let me tell you. Uh, back when, back in the '60s, when you could still buy a box of thirty oh six for four dollars and sixty cents, and three, you know, three hundred, three hundred Winchester Magnums were running for, you know, uh, seven dollars and a seven dollars and a quarter, six. I should say about six hundred, six and a half dollars. You know. Weatherby cartridges were running almost eight dollars a box. That sounds cheap now, but you know, in the '60s, that was a that was a chunk of change. So uh, I mean, that represented that that basically represented a uh, you know almost a almost a day's wage. So <coughs> it, you know, it's always been it's always been with a financial cost. Recoil is extremely high with with uh, Weatherby rifles now. In today's by today's standards, there are cartridges out there that uh, that supersede the the uh, the recoil and the power of the Weatherby series of cartridges, uh, and they you know they they have even more. Well, that's not that's not necessarily, um, if I might say, you know that's that's just making a what, what I consider to be a, a bad situation worse. That's all. Um, I've so often said that the um, the amount of velocity that you uh, derive from these uh, really flat shooting cartridges. I mean, that if there's one if there's one advantage to a Weatherby cartridge is that and, and any flat any high velocity cartridges they flat they flatten the trajectory. So you know what might be a what might be a, a six inch rainbow out to 350 yards with another rifle is only about a, a three and a half inch or four inch rainbow with a Weatherby. So it flattens things out and allows you to have a, a flatter a flatter trajectory even within standard ranges. But you know a hunter is not you know privileged to be able to plop his animals out there at a given range and say well I'm only going to shoot I'm only going to shoot my game at you know 350 yards with my rifle and I'm going to keep things you know under control so that it doesn't he doesn't suffer a tremendous damage. Well, you don't get you don't get that uh, luxury. They appear where they appear, and you know any guide will tell you that most of the game that uh, are shot at a at a hunting camp are shot within 200 yards, even on, even in the plains out in out in the prairie. It's just it's just the way things are. So uh, at those velocities, you know you're talking striking velocities in excess of 3,000 feet per second. You got some you got some notable damage. There was a friend of mine uh, years ago. He was he, he was um, owner of a uh, auto dealership, and he had that kind of money. And he he got himself a 300 Magnum, and he and he uh, struck a mule deer at uh, about 275 yards out in um, out in Colorado, and uh, he 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 promptly sold his 300 Weatherby Magnum. He didn't want anything to do with it anymore. He said he said it blew up his deer. It, it just it it caused a, it caused a ma it massacred his deer. I mean, it, he literally he, he took a picture. It, it put a stovepipe hole out the backside of that deer, and you know entrails entrails forever. And it it what a, what a mess. 
Um, it was not something that was very pretty, and uh, it ruined it ruined 40 percent of his his uh, edible meat. So uh, he, he wasn't too he wasn't too happy with the fact that it had those beautiful stunning velocities and flat trajectory. It didn't it didn't. Uh, he went back to he went back to his 3006. Um, my friend and I were trying to talk him into uh, maybe investigating a 270, but he was one of these people who thought that 270 was a bad word, and so he he didn't even want anything to do with it. But anyway, that was the name of that game. Um, and that's, that's what you have to expect with, with such uh, terrific velocities as that. Now, if you have a, um, if, if you have a, um, you know, hankering for a, a very, very uh, high velocity uh, Weatherby cartridge and, you know, and you, you're willing to accept uh, everything, the attendant recoil that comes with it. Recoil is very high, you know, recoil of a, of a 300 Weatherby Magnum is uh, considerably higher than the recoil that you'll find on a 300 Winchester Magnum. Uh, it's, it's enough that it's noticeable. Um, now I've done some, I've done some actual uh, shooting of uh, 300, uh, 300 Weatherby Magnums. Um, this I think two of them through the years. And uh, in both cases I was helping there I was helping their owners try to um, develop a develop a load. I'm going to turn this thing down here because it's going to be. I know this is going to be a nuisance. Um, anyway, uh, I was trying to help their owners, you know, develop uh, good good loads for it. Um, they have their accuracy limitations. Now, Weatherby was one of the first companies that actually offered a guarantee of accuracy, you know, because they, they poured a lot of they poured a lot of engineering into the cartridge and into the um, rifle. And uh, they you know they, they cared for their they cared for how they were being made on a uh, you know in the factory. So uh, and you know through the years they went through they went through a number of different manufacturers. Uh, Seiko made them for a short period of time. I think Schultz and Larson might have made them for some time. I don't know the history of all the different but but Hoa made them uh, for probably the greatest period of time in Japan, and they, they poured out probably the, the greatest uh, quantity of them up until recently, and I think now they're back to the United States. But um, the, uh, the, rifles, the rifles have that guarantee of accuracy of about 1.5 MOA, and I think there's a couple of exceptions to that. You know, I think it's 1.5 MOA for three-shot groups and stuff. And that's with their that's with their ammo. And like I say, they you know they they had they 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 spent some time obviously in developing uh, developing loads that uh, would that would work that were tailored tailored for their rifles and would shoot reliably uh, with with the with the uh, guns that they made. Um, for a, for a hand loader to try to to try to derive that kind of accuracy out of a um, Weatherby is a challenge. You know, my my I'm I'm not a I'm not a beginner at reloading, and in my experience, it it took it took some it took some work to get 180 grain bullets to um, to shoot satisfactorily. Uh, and I'm talking about high grade, you know, good 180 grain 30 caliber bullets. By the way, I'll, I'll talk about this sometime too. Um, that's probably the only bullet that that you should use, even on the lightest game, um, out you know in the prairie or something with a, a 300, because it, it at least keeps the speed down. If you're buying factory ammo, at least the speed is not quite as bad as it is with the 150. The 150 is the one that uh, was like a bomb in my buddy's uh, you know rifle. That that just hit like a grenade. So. Um, but the, the 150, uh, I mean the 180 is probably the more, uh, a little bit more subtle on impact. Um, subtle being a, I can't even use that term. Uh, here we go again. Well, starting to cloud over. I hope it, I hope it doesn't decide to rain. It was raining last night. But um, anyway, the uh, 
the, lo the hand loading of a, of a Weatherby can be a, a, a challenge. You know, they're, they're a big case, a lot of powder. They require a, a, a federal magnum rifle primer in order to uh, ignite all that, pri uh, that powder. That, in fact, Weatherby uh, specifically uh, states that they use the, re the federal uh, magnum primer because of that uh, huge powder volume. And that's, that's a brighter primer um, that, that that cartridge needs. Um, I, I would say that um, I would say that it's it's not it's not a series of cartridges that uh, I've heard any uh, great reports about accuracy. You know they they they're certainly uh, fabulously accurate for the type of game you're going after. You know you don't need to you know minute of a, minute of angle accuracy is uh, way more accurate. That's that varmint accuracy. You really don't need minute of angle accuracy for a uh, for a hunting rifle for for game. Uh, you know, any, any, any rifle, thousands and thousands and thousands, perhaps millions of heads of game were taken through the years with uh, rifles, you know, off-the-shelf rifles and off-the-shelf uh, ammo that was two-and-a-half MOA uh, and out to long, long range out in the prairie, too. So two-and-a-half MOA is not a, that's not an inaccurate uh, rifle, but, you know, in, in absolute terms, when people are desiring to have MOA accuracy, one, that's one inch per hundred yards. So that uh, a half inch at 50 yards, that's one one MOA. You know, 10 inches at a thousand yards is one MOA. So that's that's a minute of angle. Well, anyway, uh, you know, it, they're not stunningly accurate. So if you if you're interested in if you're interested in in having a, a rifle which is uh, superbly accurate down to that minute of angle, you you should probably shop elsewhere because that's my own personal feeling. Now, if you happen to be a, a lucky person who happens to own a, a Weatherby that, that shoots uh, three-quarters of a minute of angle accuracy, well, th that's nice for you. I, I, that's, that's a good good thing, but uh, characteristically, the, the full power loads that are really, you know, fully charged, uh, top velocity, don't generally re deliver that sort of accuracy. And also, too, uh, you know, that's not the kind of, that's not the kind of recoil that's conducive to uh, you know, pinpoint accuracy because you know they they they're flinch machines. They tend to uh, they tend to be they tend to be a little bit uh, more tuned for the uh, veteran shooter, the person who's very um, used to very much used to being uh, behind such uh, impact. So they are they are what they are. Uh, they're a great rifle. They're fantastically uh, engineered, uh, extremely strong. Probably one of the prettiest rifles that was ever made, if that's your cup of tea. Now they come in more, you know, they come in more traditional uh, offerings too, you know, with the, with the, the, uh, the different camouflage patterns on the plasticized uh, coatings and all that stuff and, and uh, fiberglass stock. So you can get all that standard fare, you know, the more pedestrian appearance than than the old, uh, than, than I would say that original Mark V. But if you still want that, if you still want that glossy effect, maybe they, they've taken a, they've taken it down a notch or two and taken away some of the some of the flair that it had back years ago. You won't see the uh, white line spaces anymore and things like that. But if if that's a cup of tea, they still have that one too. You know, it's 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 running up around fifteen hundred dollars. It's it's uh, it's in the same ballpark. Uh, Price-wise, as a uh, super-grade uh, Winchester Model 70, uh, or a, a custom shop, you know, Remington 700. That's 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 where they are, and that's the standard rifle. So anyway, uh, I can see Benny now. He wants to he, he wants to go in. Benny, Benny here. Let's let's say goodbye to people. <laughs> he's a good boy. Here he's coming on a run. Come on. Yeah, he's a he's a he's a fabulous he's a fabulous companion. He loves to be out here with. Uh, he likes to be out here. He's a ham. He likes to be out in front of the camera, and uh, I do appreciate everybody's prayers and, and their the comments that I get all the time about um, you know his his welfare. So I just want to show you he's still doing well. He's still running around with his ears flopping up and down and everything, and he. He loves it. He just he loves it, and he's doing really good. He he got a big tick bite right here. That mom pulled a big monster tick off of here last night, and boy, he really got you, didn't he? So, anyway, thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing.
If you haven't subscribed, hit that button and please do so. And I would like to hear from you. Thanks for watching. God bless. Benny, Benny, Benny. <laughs> Good boy.